So my name is Cecily Peterson. I'm a hospital medicine physician at Duke University Health System. I miss my mom and I hope there's a cure to recover that BVs one day. I had my formal training in internal medicine and internal medicine is the specialty that takes care of adults. But the real tragedy of um, neuropathy is when it starts to affect other nerves in the system. We take care of acute illnesses, but we're also the doctors who take care of patients with chronic illnesses like diabetes. When I think of diabetes, I think a lot of families losing their loved ones that have suffered from the loss of a loved one, as I have with my daughter, um, Tisha. Uh, this is her and her beautiful daughter. She also has a son uh, that graduated couple of months after she passed away in June of 2012. No, 2013, I'm sorry. Um, it's a terrible disease. I've seen my daughter go through changes with this disease for the last, well, year or two, back and forth inside of different uh, rehabilitation centers to going to doctor's appointments, them trying to find different remedies to help her or improve her lasting of living a little longer. Um, we had noticed a year before she passed that she was, wasn't going to make it um, maybe three to six months, but she lasted way longer. Um, she went from, I want to say like 160, 170 pounds down to 97 pounds prior to her death. Um, she also, you know, it's, it's just a lot, you know, dealing with this horrible, horrible disease. I felt at least would, would be a lot of what was going on with her when she was in the hospital and I, and mm -hmm. I hoped for her that this wasn't the case when she was out of the hospital, was that her diabetes started to become her identity and that was who she was. That's how people treated her. We are treating her diabetes. Mm -hmm. We are working to try and fix her diabetes and I think when she's in the hospital because you're not in your environment and you're not around your children and you're not around your family and, mm -hmm. and you're there miserably feeling the complications of your disease. I had no concerns initially about my having diabetes. I love Snickers, I love Milky Ways, uh, all the sweet stuff. Um, I would drink sodas like they were 
going out of style. After not having had uh, a full 360 physical for about four years, uh, I found a doctor that I liked, went in, had the physical, and the results were that I had type 2 diabetes. I'm just following the same line as my father, my grandfather, and I was very frightened of that and I was uh, angry about that. I had seen my grandfather with his amputations. I had seen my dad with his amputations. I was not going to live life that way. The first thing that I actually did to sort of change my lifestyle was to um, lose weight. So I started riding. I don't like being in the gym, but I don't mind being out on the bike. And I started riding and riding and riding. And I really dropped about 45 pounds within uh, a little under six months. Living with diabetes is sort of a day of uh, paying attention to details. In many respects, I think diabetics do tend to pay a lot more attention to the detail of what they're eating, uh, how tired they are, uh, how much exercise they're not getting. In a sense, diabetes was a wake-up call uh, for my general level of health. Uh, and I'm, I'm, in some respects, uh, uh, happy for that. All right, my name is Kenneth Evans. I've been type, diagnosed with type 2 diabetes for about seven years now. But as of four months ago, my doctor took me off my medication. And as long as I watch what I eat and my intake of different kind of fluids, my diabetes is in remission. I'm fine, thank you. I had taken care of Tisha a number of times while she was in the hospital, when but she come really through the emergency? after she had come through emergency, mm -hmm. and it was usually it was already at the point when she was um, what do they on call it? Deep feet. set or what do you call it? Well, she, she would have... stay in every time you turn because you know she had the heart attack. But the real tragedy of um, neuropathy is when it starts to affect other nerves in the system, mm -hmm. not just the nerves that go to the hands and the feet, but the ones that go to the stomach and the intestines. Right. And that that happened, Tisha. She then got to a point where she really couldn't eat and tolerate food, but her body so desperately needed that sugar to right. be coupled with the insulin that right. she was taking. And I think she would have just awful abdominal pain. Type 1 diabetes can be a little bit more profound when somebody gets um, starts to have symptoms from it and it can happen pretty suddenly mm -hmm. um, but over sort of a short period of time they might start to have weight loss mm -hmm. because they can't use or hold on to the calories that they are taking in um, and then they may start to also have frequent urination um, and be thirsty all the time and in a lot of patients who have type 1 diabetes right about the time when they're starting to get sick from it they may notice that more often I had a, um, a friend of mine whose daughter um, they figured out that she had diabetes when they were on a camping trip and so they went camping and she was she was about 10 years old and um, they she kept coming to her dad's side of the tent and said, I need to go to the bathroom again and he thought good lord girl you've been to the bathroom now how many times and so he'd get her up and he'd walk her over and it was and he was a physician and so it was about the fourth time when he listened to her being in the bathroom and heard that it wasn't just a little tinkle but it was this profound amount of urine that was coming out and, and she kept saying I'm so thirsty I'm so thirsty he knew that night he said I knew that's when we sort of figured out she had diabetes so in the morning we packed everybody up and we headed to the hospital because it, it became clear that something wasn't right and then in retrospect he could look back and think about um, the months before that that she just kind of gotten skinnier even though she was eating normally and the whole family had sort of explained that as well she's changing shape and she exercises a lot and that's probably what's happening um, so type 1 diabetes 
is a little bit more profound when it shows up and it can and sort of show up suddenly uh, for people or feel very sudden. Um, they, uh, people with type 1 diabetes can also present with diabetic ketoacidosis um, and that is a really acute life-threatening illness that sort of happens again, can happen pretty suddenly. Usually there's some kind of a warning to that in terms of the frequent urination and being real thirsty. And then the other thing that happens, and it's unfortunate, but it does, is that people then also are craving um, sugar and sweet. So instead of just drinking water to quench that thirst, I'll often have patients tell me, I just drank as much soda as I could get a hold of. I, was, I felt weak and I felt tired and thirsty, but I just needed sugar. And, and their body, in some ways, did need sugar because it had a lot of sugar, but no insulin to bring that sugar into the cells and make their cells um, in their whole body work the way they were supposed to. So that's usually pretty profound. Type 2 diabetes is, like I said, it's a little bit sneakier and it can show up um, over time with really, without any symptoms and it's why it's so critically important to have people um, get diabetic screening if they have risk factors for diabetes because they may have elevated sugars for a long time with absolutely no symptoms at all and that can go on for at least months and sometimes years and if they don't um, get screening from their doctor then, then um, to find out about it, then sometimes the first symptoms they have of their diabetes are complications. Things like eye problems or nerve problems, the neuropathy that can happen or the kidneys not starting to work the way they're supposed to um, or a heart attack or any of those kinds of things can be the first thing that shows up for some patients with type 2 diabetes if they never have kind of had their sugar be so high that it caused them any symptoms, but high enough that could make them sick over time. So it's, it's a little bit trickier. I think the other, one of the other big risk factors um, for type 2 diabetes is obesity and weight gain. And so that um, should be a trigger for patients who know that they're obese or know that they're overweight to um, think about and ask their doctor about screening for diabetes. Okay. Okay. What about is that the cures? And she said the complications and the causes. And um, next is the diabetic cures. That you maybe think. Is there a cure? Is, is there a closeness to maybe a cure? Uh, I don't know that I have good data to support this, but well, I am convinced in my heart that there, that within my lifetime, we will figure out, technology, medical science will figure out how to make some kind of device that will replace the pancreas in people who have type 1 diabetes. We don't have it yet, but what that would take is some kind of continuous sugar monitoring, and those systems exist, and then an insulin pump that responds to that continuous sugar monitoring. And for that to all be in one device or in one set of devices that communicate with each other and work together. I don't think that's beyond our capabilities down the line in terms of medical science. I think that that seems very reasonable because right now the cure, the only cure we have for type 1 diabetes is a pancreas transplant. So it's a transplant surgery where someone passes away and if their pancreas is still in good shape that gets uh, transplanted into another person and there's um, the person with diabetes and that is a big deal to do. It's a, it's a it's a not insignificant surgical procedure. There is absolutely a um, shortage of organ donors in this country relative to the people who um, want and need those organs. And the other issue is that it requires then, since you have something foreign of somebody else inside your body, that you take really strong medicines to prevent you from rejecting that other person's 
parts inside of you rejecting right. that pancreas. So it requires then uh, what we call immune suppressant medications similar to patients who have transplants for other things, for kidney or for the liver or for the heart or the lungs or whatever. Um, and so pancreas, did, pancreas transplants are done and they are very effective. They're just a big deal and they're not sort of the large scale cure to type 1 diabetes because the number of people who could benefit from that is way more, way, way more than the number of, of pancreases that are available to transplant into people. Those are the cures as we know them, but, um, but there's also treatments. And I think, again, treating type 1 and type 2 diabetes is very different. We don't have any other kind of a potential cure right now for type 1 diabetes. For a lot of patients with type 2 diabetes, particularly if they are obese, resolving their obesity can often resolve their type 2 diabetes. As um, I had sort of mentioned this before, but we've always thought of type 2 diabetes as being an adult's disease, but more and more because there is really an epidemic of obesity amongst our children and teenagers now, that age group is becoming more and more affected by type 2 diabetes, what we'd always called adult diabetes, but they're not adults. They're teenagers, and that's a tough place to be with a with a grown-up's disease, yeah. um, and and it's a really tough time for people to try and change their habits and change their lifestyle and make um, big changes in in weight or exercise or diet or all those things that are so critical to. Uh, treating type 2 diabetes. But can type 2 diabetes be cured? If, if obesity is a big factor, it, it can. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work for people who are very obese to be able to lose enough weight to cure and resolve their diabetes. But it, it happens. And, and certainly diet, weight control, exercise are critical factors in controlling diabetes no matter what, whether you can cure it or not. Um, and that's the case really with either type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Insulins are um, getting ever better at doing what we need them to do to um, maybe make people, make people's sugars not so out of control. That's getting better and that technology continues to advance. For patients with type 2 diabetes, there's a host of um, oral medications and some injectable medications that can help specifically with that issue of insulin resistance. So rather than only piling on additional insulin, there are medications that help target the insulin resistance and help fix that problem that caused the diabetes in the per first place for those patients with type 2 diabetes. In June 2013, the American Diabetes Association hosted its 73rd Scientific Sessions meeting. The five-day event held in Chicago brought together preeminent researchers and other healthcare experts showcasing cutting-edge research and findings on all facets of diabetes. The world's largest diabetes meeting drew nearly 18,000 participants, including clinicians and researchers from all 50 states and 117 countries, with the primary goal to stop diabetes. This year's scientific sessions program included 730 speakers, 92 symposia, 52 oral abstract sessions, 10 interest group discussions, and more than 2,175 abstract poster presentations. Chief Scientific and Medical Officer and 30-year-plus attendee, Dr. Robert Ratner, outlined the significance of bringing together this critical mass to discuss the prevention, management, and treatment of diabetes. What we're doing is we're presenting the most up-to-date data that will ultimately transfer to patient care. As diabetes grows to epidemic proportions worldwide, the value of scientific sessions and research funding is increasingly critical to the mission of the American Diabetes Association.
President, Medicine and Science, Dr. John Anderson, recognized the need for additional funding to support research initiatives to make critical inroads to stop diabetes. As always, as president of this association, it is about finding more money to fund research. Always. Dr. Anderson announced the association's innovative research program, Pathway to Stop Diabetes. The program is being launched with more than $7 million in generous gifts from individuals and $20 million from corporate founding sponsors Sanofi, Novo Nordisk, and Eli Lilly and Company Foundation. Pathway to Stop Diabetes will award research grants to a new generation of brilliant scientists, regardless of their field of study, and equip them to achieve breakthrough discoveries. Laureline Gaines, President, Healthcare and Education, has dedicated her career to educating healthcare providers about diabetes and the well-being of patients who struggle with this disease. Well, I hope to continue the work that I'm doing with students, having them impact the care of patients they've taken care of, and also try to bring along and mobilize forces to really make a difference in the communities, like our doctors, our nurses, nursing schools in particular. At the 73rd Scientific Sessions, there was some breaking news and reports on research findings. We just heard about a major advance that reduces the risk of dangerously low blood glucose levels overnight. Right here in Chicago, researchers reported that an insulin pump can actually be programmed to temporarily shut off when blood glucose levels dip too low. These findings are the latest results from a landmark government-funded study that just hit its 30th anniversary. In 1993, this NIH-funded trial first reported that keeping patients' blood glucose levels near normal reduced the early stages of eye, kidney, and nerve complications by as much as 76% compared with conventional therapy. Those are just a sampling of the wealth of information shared and discussed at the American Diabetes Association's 73rd Scientific Sessions. Visit the Association's website and social channels for more findings and research including a joint symposium with the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation and a number of insightful interviews. Driving all of the programs, initiatives, and resources for the American Diabetes Association is our focused mission to prevent and cure diabetes and to improve the lives of all people affected by diabetes. Scientific Sessions continues to be a critical component to confronting diabetes head-on and propelling us forward to our ultimate vision life free of diabetes and all of its burdens. And I don't know always that, um, that physicians recognize that yeah. as a problem because it's it's or recognize it, that it's happening or right. recognize that it's something you want to try and avoid right but to talk to her about anything else would always other than her illness would always brighten her and yeah and and bring her back to she's not just diabetes yeah she's, she's, she's a, a person. person she's somebody's mother <laughs> and, and get her in there anyway or if somebody wasn't there i would you know take her you know to the room just sneak her by but i got her that ipad and it wasn't the holidays or anything and i and i had went up to the hospital that day and you would have thought that she hit the lottery i had, i went up to the room to see her, and I left the iPad with the, one of the, her nurse that was there for that day that was taking care of her. And I told her what I was doing and I wanted to surprise Tisha. So I went on in and left that iPad wrapped up and she brought the iPad, knocked on the door and said, Tisha, somebody brought you a gift. You know, I had little flowers and a little gift and a card. And when she, she told my mom, somebody done sent me a gift. I said, I want to do what it is. And so we were sitting there talking. I said, open it up, bro. I want to see who brought, who sent you the gift. And when she saw my name and her dad and Torche and her son and her two brothers had gotten together and got her that iPad so she could communicate with her daughter, she just bust out in tears. She was just so happy, you know, that she could FaceTime now with her daughter, which already had the little iPad a year before. 
when my grandmother had been diagnosed. That was back in the late 50s. And I remember my brother and I always going over there and spending the weekend and watching her every morning shoot herself with insulin and saying to myself, how awful that is. I hope I never have to do that. As the years went by, everybody was fine in our family with it. And in later years, both of my parents developed type 2 diabetes. And then Elizabeth came along, and at age 10 years old, she was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. I remember how devastated I was when I heard that news, and how bad I felt for her, and how I watched her, um, you know, take insulin. And, and when she was very young, her mother always had to administer the insulin to her. When we'd go out to restaurants to eat, we had to make sure that the timing was just right, that she had her insulin and then was able to eat dinner. And I admired Elizabeth from that very, very young age because she never let that disease take anything away from her. In fact, it made her stronger. My name is Emily, I am eight years old, and my big sister, Christina, has diabetes. Diabetes is one of those diseases that is a family disease. It is not something that is individual. And when she was new at this, I would always want to help her. As a family, we eat healthier now because we know more about diabetes. As a parent, there's never a good night's sleep having a child with diabetes. It's constant testing, um, constant worrying about low blood sugars. Um, she's hypoglycemic unaware, so she can sleep through a 30 blood sugar, and if we don't catch it, she can wind up in the hospital. When we first put Ashley in preschool over at the Jewish Community Center in Maitland, Reese would go there and sit in the lobby for five hours a day, every day while Ashley was in preschool. She couldn't leave. She would bring a book with her, read a lot of books, but she couldn't run errands. She would just stay there and make sure everything was all right. Um, a couple of years ago, she wanted to go to camp, and our oldest son, Ryan, heard us talking that we might not send her to camp because of the diabetes, because there was no one there trained to watch her. And he said to us, Mom and Dad, if that's what's stopping you, then I'll learn how to take care of her. I'll learn how to test her blood sugars and give her insulin and count carbohydrates, and that way she won't miss out on camp. When I was a young child, my grandmother had diabetes. And of course, I was a very young child, didn't understand what it meant at that time. But I just knew that she was always having to go take shots and, and stepping away. And that was my first and only really experience with diabetes until years later when my first daughter was diagnosed with diabetes at the age of 10 years old. It affected us in a way that we had to have more defined times of eating and more defined types of food in order to get Elizabeth what she needed to eat. Um, it also affected us because I remember coming home from the hospital and having to measure very carefully the correct amounts of insulin in the syringe and then making sure the air bubbles were out and giving her the shots several times, three or four times a day. On September 1st, 1997, uh, complications of diabetes took the life of my father. At, during the time when he struggled with this disease, I was not very knowledgeable of it. After working with the association, it's sort of like I wish I knew then what I knew now and I, I thought I could really have helped him. But I may not be able to help him now, but I'm able to help uh, tons of people in the community, other family members, and all the great volunteers I'm meeting through the association. I got involved with the American Diabetes Association about seven years ago. Uh, and the reason I did is because my grandmother was afflicted with diabetes and she had type 1 and was constantly giving her insulin on a daily basis. And my grandmother, through her later years, she could just see the complications, what it's caused to her as she had incontinence problems, uh, heart problems, and other issues throughout her life, and basically passed away because of complications. So that I'm here to help fight the fight uh, with American Diabetes uh, every day, trying to do something to bring awareness, uh, raise money, and just be part of the, the Diabetes Army. I think one of the tough things that happened for Tisha is that she um, developed such severe neuropathy, nerve That's damage. Nerve, yeah. 
that that also affected the nerves of her intestines and her stomach. Because she didn't have any feelings in her legs. Didn't have feelings in her she legs. That's how she herself. Had, it was time. real, didn't have really, or so. people will step on something and mm -hmm. not realize that they have a, a nail or a screw mm -hmm. or a toy or a something that's made foot. its way up into their foot and it causes a disastrous mm -hmm. infection and, yeah. and that can absolutely happen. But I think Part of what may, started to make her diabetes so brittle and have yeah. such huge swings is that she um, couldn't always tolerate getting nutrition in. Right. Once she started on the tube feed, she couldn't even tolerate always being able to leave that those tube feeds. In, right. in the middle of her back, her it would just ache. Her body would ache. You know, her feet from from the burn. Uh, from her being on a vacation uh, one time, and she I felt had burned her whole would, would be a lot of what was going on with her when she was in the hospital, and I and I hoped for her that this wasn't the case when she was out of the hospital, was that her diabetes started to become her identity, and that was who she was. That's how people treated her. We are treating her diabetes. Mm -hmm. We are working to try and fix her diabetes. And I think when she's in the hospital, because you're not in your environment and you're not around your children and you're not around your family and, mm -hmm. and you're there, they really come in two different flavors. And one is warnings, a warning that you're getting very sick and you might need to be hospitalized for diabetes. That's what you see when you have real frequent urination, being very thirsty, maybe being hungry, losing a lot of weight very rapidly over the course of a couple of days, which is really water weight. It's from getting severely dehydrated. That's a warning sign that you don't want to wait. If this starts on Thursday, you want to say, well, I'll get an appointment with my doctor next week. That's something that you need to be seen for right away. And you may need to be hospitalized for. Um, that's sort of the, the warning signs of, of a crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, related to diabetes. But I think there are also warning signs that people have um, in type 2 diabetes that maybe things are sort of sneaking up on them. And unfortunately, what they often are, are the complications of diabetes. So people will start to notice they're getting numbness or tingling in their feet or in their fingers. And that's actually early neuropathy. And that can develop you know, years after years of having low enough level diabetes that it's doing damage to the nerves, but never got to a point where you have symptoms of the frequent thirst or the, um, the frequent urination. The other warning sign that I would say um, maybe is obvious and maybe isn't so obvious is real rapid weight gain, only because that's a risk factor. So when somebody gains a lot of weight, they've maintained a healthy weight and then um, something changes as they get older or their, um, uh, you know, their metabolism changes because they're entering menopause or one of those kinds of things and they, and they end up um, gaining a lot of weight, that's in some ways a warning sign that you're at risk for diabetes and again a reason to, um, to look to your doctor to be screened for that. And then most importantly, to try and halt that weight gain and start to reverse it to prevent, protect yourself from diabetes. Okay, nutrition and oh, exercise so, and, and... So this should happen every time someone's diagnosed with diabetes, but if it doesn't happen, then I think patients need to be their own best advocate they get di diagnosed with diabetes or pre-diabetes, they absolutely need to see a dietitian for nutrition education about the foods that they should be eating and the foods that they should be avoiding and how they should coordinate eating with any medications that they may be on and all of those things. That's absolutely critical. There just isn't a uh, reasonable way to expect that patients can come up with all that information on their own and it's usually not something that um, physicians or their practices necessarily have the time or 
resources to be able to give that education. Um, so if they don't have some kind of diabetes education available at the physician practice, then they absolutely need to get that, that nutrition education um, from a dietitian um, and, and a diabet or a diabetic educator. And there are nurses who are trained as diabetic educators who teach both about diabetes and about the nutrition. One of the tough parts, um, particularly in type 2 diabetes, is that you have a lot of things that affect what someone's diet and what their nutrition should be. So because diabetes will often um, keep company with high blood pressure or heart disease um, or high cholesterol, there is, and diet is an important factor in the control and treatment of all of those conditions, you really need a comprehensive diet that will answer each of those issues. Sugar certainly is the big offender. Sugar and complex sugars, which are carbohydrates, are the big offenders in type 2 diabetes in terms of making the, the sugar levels go up and, and causing the complications of diabetes over time. But just to replace those sugars with foods that may cause problems for your other conditions doesn't really help matters either. So um, uh, the less processed a food is, the better it is generally for you. So fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, um, let, if you're going to eat grains and starches, the less processed they are, the better. So giving up cereal out of the boxes, giving up the white bread, um, giving up the, the um, fluffy pasta, um, giving up a lot of the, the, those white potatoes, all of those kinds of things which really carry with them a lot of starch or carbohydrate, right. which, is, which your body turns into sugar and makes the sugars go up, that's, an, that's a big issue. Focusing on allowing the sugars that you get in your system to come from sugar that's naturally in the food that you eat and, um, and as fresh as possible helps out with the other issues. So um, that, that gets to be trouble and it gets to be complicated for patients who um, live in areas where it's not easy to access fresh fruits and vegetables. What then becomes the, the replacement for that are things like the canned vegetables. Well, the canned vegetables carry a lot of salt which isn't so bad for diabetes, but cause a problem for high blood pressure. And because the diabetes and the high blood pressure can kind of go together in a person, you kind of can't take one, di one diet and sac that fixes one problem and sacrifices the other. Um, generally, the frozen vegetables, um, if there isn't salt added to them, are going to be a better choice if fresh things aren't available. Um, I often tell my patients that if you're going to pick a fruit or a juice, always pick the fruit. Um, the amount of uh, sugar relative to the other things that are in whole fruit, like the fiber um, and uh, uh, non-digestible things that will make you feel full uh, without giving you a whole bunch of sugar, you get a whole lot more of that in fruit than you do in juice. So giving up the juices is really kind of another critical piece to avoiding the sugars. I think the other thing that becomes an issue and is pro and there's probably a lot of peer pressure issues from this uh, for teenagers um, and young adults in particular is the sugar-filled sodas. That is really culturally a part of um, of the American teenage culture is drinking soda and and usually not diet soda but usually um, sugar-filled soda and that it has a tremendous amount of sugar in it and it and those dietary requirements really add to the complexity of taking care of someone with taking care of a teenager who develops adult onset diabetes or um, associated with obesity or otherwise, but type 2 or adult onset diabetes 
it's really tough because there's a there's a culture that they live in, maybe not the culture they live in with their parents, but certainly the culture they live in with their peers, that those are normal foods to and normal drinks to take in every day um, and can be devastating for someone who has type 2 diabetes and can, can really contribute a lot to obesity, which is sort of the other issue. Type 1 diabetes, dietary um, uh, interventions are important, but they're much more complicated in some ways. Those patients absolutely need to have some sugar and some carbohydrate in their meals and throughout the day. Um, and so that really needs to be balanced and a diabetic educator or a registered dietitian really needs to be able to give that individual education, um, understanding a, particularly for a child, what a child's eating habits are and how to manipulate um, habits and favorite foods and all those kinds of things into a diet that provides enough carbohydrate and enough sugar to keep them healthy and growing um, and uh, feeding their brain and feeding their body without putting them at risk for real high spikes in the sugar. Likewise, you know, avoiding sugars altogether or carbohydrates altogether in that population is absolutely dangerous because then they run the risk of having low sugars or hypoglycemia. So that's a much more complex um, diet that the type one diabetics those childhood diabetics have to follow. And for all of those reasons, because some kids are picky and because there are peer pressures and you don't eat all your meals at home and all for all of those reasons, um, that uh, type one diabetes absolutely requires the integrated care of, an, of a nutritionist, diabetic educator, a registered dietitian to help uh, families and patients make the right food choices. Really, diabetes is a preventable disease. In in that, um, if a you know type two diabetes again the the, the form that most commonly affects um, most Americans, because it is a, it is a matter of um, energy balance, um, and so you know Americans' caloric intake on average is probably fifty to hundred percent more than they need. To get by, right? Supersize this, you know, big gulps, you know, soft drinks, and so um, in terms of diet, um, a diet. It's not that you have to go completely without carbohydrates, but uh, you've probably heard about the glycemic index, and so aiming for foods that are lower in the glycemic index, making carbs count when you eat them, and everything in moderation. I think are, are some uh, keys to, to a good diet. So, so what do I mean by that? Um, so carbs are in m much of what we eat. Um, bread, rice, pasta, potatoes, fruit. Um, one doctor in my clinic calls um, fruit nature's candy. Um, and again, it's not to say that all food is bad, but just, you know, Fruit juice isn't exactly isn't exactly healthy for you if if you drink too much of it, right? Um, you know, and so what what doesn't have carbs, right? Protein, meat, fish, um, vegetables that like um, broccoli or even greens um, that aren't starchy, um, uh, and uh, uh, you know, and, and dairy has carbs because of the sugar in it, but um, things like cheese have less carbs, you know, nuts, uh, and, and so on. Um, and so a diet that sort of emphasizes that end of the spectrum. So one thing I like to tell patients is, um, you know, if you like steak, you know, you can eat steak. Big steak, no potato, right? And some vegetables, right? You like pasta, spaghetti, you can have spaghetti, you know. Um, a tomato sauce that's made that you make from canned tomatoes, right? 
Um, not the sugary stuff that you get like from ragu because it has a lot of sugar in it. That's one way they make it taste good. Big meatballs, little pasta, right? Because um, the brown, ground beef is okay. That's okay. Um, and, you know, and then don't overdo it with the frying and all that. And, you know, and there are ways to do that, uh, to, again, to, to cook meats healthier. Um, eggs, right? I love eggs. And so eggs are a low-carb food. Um, and so, you know, so that, that's, that's uh, some things about diet is that, you know, you can actually eat a lot of the stuff that you like. So that doctor that I mentioned who runs a lifestyle clinic at the Duke Outpatient Clinic, you know what he eats for lunch every day? Cookout. A burger, no bun, right? You, you know, lettuce, tomato. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, so just as an example. Another thing about diet is that there are a lot of empty calories, right? That don't make us feel full, um, you know, that don't, you know, make us healthier. Like soda is a great one, right? And so even switching to diet soda, if you must drink soda um, or water whenever you can, uh, you know, really can make a big difference and, and is an easy way to drop weight without really noticing it, um, you know. And so the role of exercise. And so, you know, people will, um, I don't know, have you ever watched the, the Biggest Loser? I mean, do you see how hard those people have to work? They're literally working out six hours a day. They're, they're working out almost as long as you and I are at work each day. And, and then, you know, you also see that they're eating like next to nothing. And so that's what it really takes to drop the kind of weight that they're doing. So if you've got the equation wrong, remember this is about energy balance. If you're not, if you're already taking too much in, it is really, really, really hard for exercise to be enough unless you're exercising again like six hours a day. And so a good example of this, you know, are, um, you know, professional athletes. Right when you see them, and in the summer, they're you know especially the big linemen, they just they're they're huge. It's because they're not working out six seven hours a day, right? Um, they're just you know they still got the same appetites, right? Um, and so if they're not watching that, then they're gonna you know you hear about those star players report out of shape to training camp, right? That's exactly uh, the issue. Activity, you know, helps. It's critical, but it, it's not enough. And so, um, you know, one of the other keys to diet is, like, is portion control. And so an easy way to do this is to get smaller plates. If you can eat off a salad plate, no seconds, right? Go ahead, pile on, because it's not going to be as much as, you know, you're not going to be eating as much as the big plate um, and, and, and with seconds. Um, uh, and so, with respect to exercise, um, you know, you, you don't have to kill yourself. Uh, and you can, you know, what, what, we, what we preach is um, 20 to 30 minutes, five to six times a day. You know, and if you do more, um, like a couple hours on the weekends, that can count for a few days. Um, and, you know, what we, 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 we encourage people to do moderately aerobic exercise. Things that get your heart rate above 100, things that give you a light sweat at least, right? And so depending on, you know, if you like to garden, that can, that can be it. Um, uh, um, you know, and then, and then for people who, who have issues with joint pain and other things, um, you know, getting in the water can help. Some people find um, uh, bicycling, right, either stationary or, or a regular bike, easier on the knees than say uh, running or even walking. Um, I have flat feet, so yeah, I mean, that, that goes for me too. Um, biking is, a, uh, is, is, is what I prefer to do. Yeah, and so even though I didn't know Tisha uh, for that long, or didn't have the privilege of knowing Tisha for that long, people in our clinic did. And so um, when, I, when I circulated you know, the funeral announcement, we actually posted it to, the, to our internal clinic um, Facebook page, some of the residents who knew her, who had seen her in clinic, um, responded um, because, um, you know, and 
And the first thing that I'll say about Tisha is that she was brave. It was a very difficult decision that she made near the end. Um, well, like now, me and my brother, Tori, we have to like, we stay with our grandparents now. So, and like me, my brother, like we both loved our mom like so much, like we'll do whatever she say, we did. And with my grandparents, like you know, they actually loved my, my mom. So, like, if she needed a thing, my grandma or if my grandma wasn't here, my granny would go up, like, go up there and see what she needed. I hope one day somebody might find a cure or a medicine. I, I hope the scientists just, like, find something. It's the number one killer is taking lives daily. And we need to get the money and resources together to find a cure to end this so that we don't have to worry about diabetes anymore. Her loss has been devastating. I really, really do miss her. It not only affects me as a mother, but it affects her children that will never see her again. So let's get a cure. <laughs>